Arm Holdings, based in Cambridge, England, powers most of the world's smartphones and tablets, and it will soon power the new Apple Mac computers. Apple announced the transition to a new chip that they can customize during the keynote presentation at the 2020 Apple Worldwide Developers Conference, but there was no reference to Arm Holdings that is licensing the technology. ARM has sold over 50 billion chips since they started 35 years ago, and they plan to sell 50 billion more just in the next two years. So what makes ARM architecture so special and even caused Apple to make a switch from Intel chips? ARM architecture includes fewer transistors, overall slower clock speed, lower number of instructions and, as a result, better performance per watt. These features and others combined translate into a battery that lasts longer and produces less heat. According to Apple, the transition will also establish a common architecture across all Apple products, making it far easier for developers to write and optimize their apps for the entire ecosystem. ARM CEO Simon Segas gave a presentation during the company annual gathering a few months before the Apple event. He explained how the company operates and the outlook for the future. We provide the highlights from that event, as ARM architecture and its competitors will have an increasing importance with the deployment of new technologies like 5G and Internet of Things. Take a listen. Our business is about licensing IP to people who want to build chips and build innovative products on top of those chips. And historically, in our company's now 29-year history, uh, the way of accessing that technology was to do your design on, on paper, on PowerPoint, choose which IP you wanted from us. We would do a license agreement. You'd take the IP home, build your system. And if it turned out you wanted something else, you forgot something, we didn't quite understand what you needed, you'd have to come back with us, uh, back to us, and, and so the cycle would go on. So that, we determined, is, you know, with the complexity and the flexibility that people want today is slowing things down. So we've changed our model um, to now, through the ARM Flexible Access Program, for a minimal upfront fee, we provide a broad range of access to lots and lots of our technology. That means you can download it, you can play with it, you can do your system design for real with the RTL, simulate your system, run code, see what it does, make those different design trade-offs, and then when you've proven your design and you're ready to go, that's when you come and close a license with us, that's when you pay for the IP that you're actually going to need. So we think that this is going to uh, expand on uh, the capability to do design, uh, accelerate innovation, uh, and enable you all to move quicker. A lot of our IP uh, is available through this program, long list here, we will add more to it over time. And in fact, if you look back over the last couple of years, about 75% of the licenses that we've signed uh, are covered by the IP that's in the Flexible Access program. Uh, and this isn't just existing partners changing the way they do business with us. Uh, these are new companies, new to the ARM ecosystem, uh, OEMs, startups, looking to build silicon to take advantage of all these opportunities that we have ahead of us. So talking of evolution, uh, we're evolving our technology, we're evolving the way we, we do business, um, but we're also thinking about uh, how processing is actually done uh, on these underlying uh, compute engines. So I'm really pleased to be able to share with you today that we are, for the very first time, enabling people to add custom instructions into ARM CPUs. Now, we've never done that before. We are a company famed for standardization. That standardization has been a great thing because it's enabled the development of a really strong and mature and powerful ecosystem. Software applications that you get that were written for one ARM processor will run on pretty much every other ARM processor in the same architecture family. Uh, and that has led to um, a rapid deployment of these silicon devices. But we're seeing that with the uh, evolution of the workloads that people want to run on the devices, there's a scope for adding different flexibility within the chips. You can already do that today through coprocessors. You can add accelerators in the memory map. You, there are different ways in which you can expand the compute capability of a device. But with uh, the custom instructions, you can now put that right into the core of the processor and enable fine grain optimization of algorithms. How's this work? Well, at a 30,000 foot view, this is how a microprocessor works. 
There are basically four stages to it. It fetches instructions, it decodes them, it executes them, and it writes the results back into the register file. What we've done to allow custom instructions to be added to the core is put in the hooks into the decode and the execution phases of the processor so that as these custom instructions come down the pipe, you can decode them to do whatever it is you want to do with them. You can run your own execution unit. You can stall the pipe while that is going on. And then you can write, uh, write the results back and, and update the flags. So we've put those hooks right into the core. You can use them to do whatever you want. Things we're thinking about are applications where you know, the odd instruction here or there, which not every processor needs, so we don't want to put the, the weight of, those, uh, of that logic in every processor, but applications where an extra instruction or two would make a big difference. Great example is in um, storage applications or modem applications where you want to look at a, uh, a, the, the bits in a word and work out how many ones and zeros there are separately. You, know, you can do that in logic relatively straightforward, in a relatively straightforward way, but you don't want it in every application but you might want it in your application, and this will enable a way for you to do just that. Now, the first product that we're putting this into is Cortex-M33, and there will be an update to that processor coming uh, early next year. We picked M33 uh, because it's already an incredibly flexible processor. Configurable, it has trust zone for security, DSP features, memory protection, and it's tiny, and it's really energy efficient. There are about 30 licensees of Cortex-M33 already, uh, many of whom have products coming to market now. This uh, processor has been out for a couple of years, and we're seeing those first designs come through. So this is a, a big change for us. We're, we're thinking about uh, how we evolve continually, how we enable this fifth wave of computing, which, as I explained, has evolved a lot over the last 12 months, whether it's handsets or 5G service or AI or IoT, uh, we're seeing now uh, the growth of these technologies and the opportunity that comes from bringing them all together. Those opportunities are going to require a lot more software running on a lot more processing, uh, processing engines built in a lot more chips, which offer a lot more flexibility to the kind of solutions that you build and bring to market. Now, I've said many times before that I believe that 5G is really foundational to the next generation of computing devices. For us as consumers with our smartphones that, frankly, we can't leave, lead our lives without, it's going to lead to better devices, faster download, uh, more responsive, better interactivity. It will lead to developers creating applications that make use of all of those features, and we'll enjoy that. We'll enjoy the innovation that comes from it. The real promise, I believe, is that ability to connect billions and billions and billions of more devices to the network. As I said, you can't do that with networks today. Every other network has been designed around how many people are there carrying smartphones. 5G allows you to connect what we anticipate will eventually become a trillion connected devices straight onto a cellular network. The network is designed to cope with that kind of volume. And it has many features which you know, really enable then innovation around these connected things. You can create slices of the network with their own characteristics of upload and download speed, their own quality of service, their own security features, and isolation from each other uh, to enhance security. Security is also one of the main focus in the development of all Apple devices. And this was highlighted during the keynote at the Apple event. This is how ARM architecture addresses the issue. Cyber criminals are using more and more modern techniques against us, uh, and they've gone as far as using AI against us. We've seen competitions run at hacking conferences where two different systems are pitted against each other, you know, something trying to defend itself using AI, something trying to attack using AI. Uh, the, the technologies are getting more and more sophisticated. We've seen people injecting noise into video streams, into audio streams to confuse the machine learning models. We've seen people hacking in to upset the parameters of the model, so that's a pretty obvious attack. And more and more ways in which people are using machine learning uh, against us. So unfortunately, uh, it seems there is no end to the ingenuity of bad people, and so we have to keep evolving uh, what we're doing in our defenses against these new categories of attack. This is a new experimental architecture that we're looking at uh, to help partition uh, applications and data away from each other. Many, many systems run multiple applications, and people look for ways to hack into systems. They look for weak spots to exploit. 
The technology here will create a very, very rigid isolation from one application to the next. And so if uh, a penetration does occur, uh, the scope of that penetration is limited. And the way I think about this is, imagine someone is going to try and break into your house. You've gone out for the evening, you're having dinner in a nice restaurant somewhere, some bad dude is staking out your house looking for the way to break in, and they determine that your kitchen window is the way that they're gonna get into your house. They break in, they think they're in your whole house, and when they get into your kitchen, what they find is there are no doors into the rest of your house. They are stuck in there. So they may steal your food mixer and your toaster, but they don't run away with uh, you know, your, your big screen TV. So this is a way, this technology is a way of isolating uh, the issues that come when uh, uh, penetrations do occur, because they probably are still going to. Technology is coming together and maturing at the same time that I think will unleash a new era, a new set of opportunities for us to build new applications and find new ways uh, to leverage uh, the underlying science. And in the last 12 months, we've seen progress on all fronts. We've seen 5G handsets launched from numerous OEMs. We've seen 5G service deployed from many, many operators around the world. And we've seen businesses adopting AI in their everyday practice in many, many different ways. But for me, it's the combination of these technologies that makes this such an exciting period uh, for us to be in. And what's driving uh, the, the growth of all these different technologies is the ubiquity of intelligent semiconductors. Not just the volume, but it's the pace that is staggering. Uh, cumulatively, this partnership has shipped 150 billion chips based on ARM technology. That is a lot of silicon devices, and you all have used them to create amazing products. So the numbers are huge, but it's the growth rates that I find particularly staggering. It took 50 years to ship the first 50 billion. We're anticipating that the next 50 billion will ship in two years alone. So at some point in the not too distant future, that 150 billion that, you know, trust me, we're proud of, it's going to seem uh, just like a warm-up act.